Hello and welcome to CMC. I'm Carol Looper and I'm a member of the CMC Board of Trustees and a retired journalist, but they tell me journalists never retire. Now a quick note, a little bit of a difference from our usual forums. Audience questions are to be submitted today in writing. If you open your forum flyer, you will see that there is a piece of paper in there. Please write your name and your question and members of the CMC Program Committee will select the best and most pertinent and read them to our guests. Today's forum, The First 100 Days, is part of our political series. And our sponsors are the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation and Hannah News Service, with additional support from Steiner Public Relations, the Dispatch Media Group, and WBNS 10 TV. Each of our sponsors are represented here by many colleagues and friends. You can see them around the tables. Please help me thank them. And I'm going to welcome Scott Light, political anchor and host of Face the State on WBNS 10 TV, and he will introduce our speakers. Scott. Who says we can't have bipartisanship anymore with our two representatives? Exactly. As Carol said, 100 days, the political debates continue. Recently in my son's ninth grade, this was in his math class, so I'm not lying, they got involved in a political debate. And he happened to tell the, the group that, well, you know, my dad is, is in the media, works for WBNS for, for CBS News. And a student immediately chimed in and said, well, he, he's fake news. <laughs> and it got a chuckle from the class. And then, and then afterwards, she, she said, no, CBS is fake news. And I, I, he told me that story. Of, of course, I hated that he got embarrassed in, in class by <clears throat> his dad's job. But I thought about that. And I thought, it, it didn't make me mad that somebody said that. I've been called way worse as a member of the media. Um, but it made me sad. That, that that's yet another myth that's you know, now lumped into the hundreds of myths out there nationwide, and, and let's say on all sides of the political spectrum, from the left, from the right, and, and from the, the middle. So they're out there, and we have to make sure that, that we're talking about the truth, because the truth matters. And that's why this event is terrific. So thank you for letting me be a small part of it, and, and to all of you who are here. Uh, it's just terrific to see a packed house here. So let's get to it. We've got some great guests. We've got questions and answers, and um, we're going to all learn something from our forum today. So I get the privilege of introducing our terrific guests. First, representing the 3rd District, Democrat from Ohio, Joyce Beatty. Republican representing the 12th district. And let me say, this gentleman always insists that 10 TV's Dom Tiberi pronounces his name incorrectly all the time. That's right. It is Congressman Pat T. Berry. Also chief content director of news and of public affairs at WOSU, public media, Mike Thompson. Take it away. Well, thank you all for coming. Obviously, the, uh, as we near the end of our three months of the Twitter transition, the interest is still high in what's going on in Washington. And of course, we don't need Oval Office addresses when our president is uh, making proclamations or criticizing the media or reliving the election uh, 140 characters at a time. So in preparation, I went through both Congressman T. Berry and Congressman Beatty's Twitter feeds. And you know, <laughs> they're pretty boring, I'll be honest. <laughs> Pat T. Berry wished us a happy Easter and a happy Passover. Uh, he wants tax reform. Joyce Beatty says, go Blue Jackets. Uh, she wants to keep the Affordable Care Act. Her campaign account did call President Trump the golfer in chief. <laughs> Is that the best you got? <laughs> <laughs> we hope to get a little more in depth than 140 characters here today. And I've asked uh, both Congress, Congressman T. Berry and Congresswoman Beatty to keep their answers short so we can get to a lot of stuff and so we can easily edit this, because we're going to put it on TV on Columbus on the Record Friday night at 8.30. So the tone in Washington, Congressman Tiberi, I'll start with you. 
This is your third transition. You came in in 2001 with George W. Bush. Right. You saw the transition to the Democrats and President Obama in 2009. Now, Donald Trump. What's it been like, and how does it compare to those previous transitions? Well, I, I was going to do this first uh, for one of your members. <laughs> Who isn't here? This is Doug Price. I was going to play a joke on him. He's the one who got me here. Good to be with all of you today. Um, I'll do, a, I'll do a, a quick reminder, Mike. You, you, you might not remember this. Uh, I do because I was there and I was just getting, I just got sworn in in 2001. There was controversy at the beginning of the Bush administration. Just as a you little. Might remember. Uh, it seemed like it seems, a lot. Seems like nothing now, though. It seems like nothing now, but there, there was. And, and obviously, at the, at the beginning of the Obama administration, we Republicans thought that we were a, a dead party, right? Time Magazine said the Democrats will be in charge forever now. Democrats had 60 seats in the Senate, which in my lifetime hasn't happened for either party, with the President and, and the House, and they had a clear supermajority. So we were clearly depressed. Uh, so very different, all three very different. But you know what's also very different today? And Scott, Scott kind of mentioned it is we're having an entirely different debate in America today with respect to the news media. Because in 2001, even though that wasn't very long ago, there was much less news than there is today. Because there's not, there wasn't Breitbart, Huffington Post, all these other outlets that are very different than traditional news like yours and yours. So people are now self-selecting what they want to hear and what they want to see on TV, which is very different for public policymakers, whether you're a Democrat and Republican. That has made Washington, or helped make Washington, much more partisan than it was in 2009 or 2001. Congresswoman Beatty, you've, you've been in the minority since you joined Congress, but you always had sort of the veto backstop of a president who could stop policies you've oppo you would oppose. But now, Democrats are in a tough position. All the branches of government are controlled by Republicans or conservatives. What can you, what are you able to do? Is it frustrating to be in the minority in Congress these days? Well, let me first also so thank you to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for having us here. I've been in the minority all my life. So, <laughs> so, and I think I turned out pretty well. So for me, it's like, is the glass half empty or, or half full? Uh, it is frustrating on many occasions. Uh, I take great pleasure on the days that our party is very united. Uh, I probably could say that same question to the other side of the aisle, because uh, they're very divided. There's something called the Freedom Caucus, the Republican Caucus. We just have the Democratic Caucus. Um, but in, in all sincerity, I think Pat is absolutely right when he talks about how time has changed. I can remember when President Obama was uh, elected and he wanted to carry his Blackberry. And everybody went up in arms. Oh my God, don't let the president have a Blackberry. Now we have a president that tweets 140 words, speaks in 140 words uh, at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I, I think what we also have to look at being in the minority is it's different. It's different. I had the pleasure of having a president with veto power. Now we have a president that switches his power every 140 words. Um, at night is one thing, in the morning is another thing. Uh, but you always should end with something positive. We are so far to the left and so far to the right that thank goodness there are people who understand how to go down the middle. And so I am very hopeful. I'm also hopeful because there are a number of women who are more engaged. When you talk about where we were when Pat came in and where we are today, uh, thank you to the women. Democrat and Republican women understand how it makes a difference in the lives of their families. We understand because there are more of us in the workforce. There are more of us who are voting. So there's power. Uh, I'm a female, minority, African American. I think I'm doing okay. All right. uh, let's get to the issues. We'll start with health care. Um, Pat T. Berry, uh, we all know that there was a bill before Congress that didn't have enough support to pass. Um, Republicans and you have been trying to repeal Obamacare since it was passed in 2010. Uh, you were one of the champions of the bill that did not 
gather enough support to pass this time. But now you are working on a new bill. Uh, might be presented next week. Not a new bill. Well, a different bill. Additions to the bill. Additions to the bill. What additions will there be, and how different will it be from the one that was presented uh, well, a few it's not, weeks back? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not done yet. Obviously, okay. there's a lot of discussions going on between uh, different factions of the, of the um, Republican team. And it's always, you know, it's always easier to be united when you're in the minority, because being in the minority unites you against whatever the majority is for. And so going back to you know, 2009, 2010, the Affordable Care Act that you talked about, having had a front row seat, uh, it took a year, <coughs> almost over a year, to get the two bills because the Democrat leadership in the House was on a different page than the Democrat leadership in the Senate. So while we were just an afterthought being in the minority, there was a lot of fighting on the Democrat side with different factions of the Democrats. We're having that same issue now uh, played out in social media and in, in the national media uh, as we speak. So trying to hit the sweet spot of those factions has been challenging, particularly when you're repealing something that Democrats are generally pretty supportive of. So we are trying to talk to members on the left of our conference, on the right of our conference, to see where that sweet spot might be. Will there be subsidies for health insurance in the, in the additional Obamacare light, as some of my colleagues will call it? <laughs> Well, sure, because there are people, so we're talking really about less than 10% of the market today after you look at 61% of Americans have employer-provided health care. Then you have Americans who have Medicare, Americans who have Medicaid, Americans who have VA coverage. The individual market is what's collapsing, and that's where most of the focus, quite frankly, is, is in the individual market. We in Franklin County are lucky because we have choices on the individual market. The Affordable Care Act subsidized many people in that market. And so if you're subsidized in that market, you don't, you don't see the premium increases that if you're not subsidized. And you don't see all the, all the, uh, the, 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 the problems that the private sector person, the small business person, the person who uh, doesn't have employer-provided health care. So to answer your question, yes, it'll be through a tax credit. Because quite frankly right now, Mike, you get subsidized with your health care through WOSU. And everybody who has employer-provided health care gets subsidized. Why shouldn't we subsidize people on the individual market? Whether they're in between jobs, whether they're poor, or, or whether they have a, a job that doesn't have employer-provided health care. So yes, through a tax credit. Joyce Beatty, um, Obamacare has its problems. I mean, collapsing yes. might be too strong a word. Most people say it's not collapsing. It has its issues. Uh, rural counties. Uh, have one choice of health insurer for this private exchange market. The premiums have gone up. They've gone up by 90 or 100 percent here in Ohio in some parts. Deductibles are rising. Um, what, what fixes will you agree to, and will you work with Republicans to do it? Well, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, we need health care, and, and that's the common denominator that we all agree on. Obviously, when you have some 30 million people who signed up for the Affordable Care Act, when you have things in it that even our president said that he would keep being female as not being a pre-existing condition, allowing 26-year-olds to stay on their parents' insurance. So there are a lot of good things. It's not perfect. Uh, I said that before, and, and I'll say it repeatedly. When you think about most of the things that we have, there are people in this room who have a Medicare card. Medicare, some 50 plus years ago, has been tweaked more than a half dozen times. When we came out with the Affordable Care Act, we knew it would need some changes then. But we also found out that my colleagues on the other side for six, 65 times came to the floor to repeal it. So part of me says we have to work together, but we also means both sides have to work together. You, you cannot, in a 10-day period, decide that you're going to repeal something and, and then figure out it's complicated. Well, it took us seven years, you know, seven years to put something together. And, and it's not a Republican or Democrat thing. You had Republican presidents who wanted a health care plan. You, you had candidates who ran on both sides of the aisle that wanted a health care. We live in a wonderful democracy, and everybody should have the right to have an affordable health care plan. Congressman Tiberi, is, is, is health care a right that the government should help provide? 
health care is something that the government should help provide as a social safety net to people. We've been doing it. That, that was litigated a long time ago with Medicaid and, and, and Medicare. But the reality, Mike, is if you're a governor, Medicaid expansion's a great deal at 100%, then 95%, and then 90% in perpetuity. When we look at the federal pie chart, Medicaid is the fastest growing program in the federal government. And so we're going to have a fight on budgets coming up. And what we're going to fight about is called discretionary spending, corporation of nat uh, public broadcasting's a big fight. It's peanuts compared to the real problem of mandatory spending, which is Medicaid. So in Ohio right now, if you're on traditional Medicaid, the federal government has, for 50 years, said we're going to re reimburse states 62%. And now, for able-bodied people between 101 and 138 percent in perpetuity, we're going to do 90. It's unsustainable. That's, the, That's under, part the poverty of level, the, the Affordable poverty. Care Act. But, but I, I just have to say this. When you talk about Medicaid, because I think our role is also about education and awareness. So often when people say Medicare and able-bodied folks, you have to remember we have a large number of people who are disabled. So it, Medicaid is not only for those at a lower economic income, it's also those with disability. So we have to take that. Uh, into consideration. Okay. And to answer your question, I am a proponent of government being a partner in providing Medicaid and Medicare services because they're part of our mandatory budget and not our discretionary. Tax reform is another issue that's going to be on your plate when you both get back to Washington next week. Um, the Congress and the President are working on comprehensive tax reform. Um, Pat Tiber, you say you want a system that would give us a tax form that you could fit on the back of a postcard. So my question to you is, can I put my mortgage deduction line item on that postcard? Can I put my <laughs> child credit on that? Can I put my health care expenses, my job expenses, no. all that stuff on no, there? No, but you'd have the choice, Mike. Think about this. You know, one of the most important things that Ameri if, you, if we listen, that Americans complain about is not the tax rate, it's the complexity of the tax code. One of my colleagues has said, since 1986, <coughs> we have grown the tax code so big that it has more pages in the Bible and none of it's good news. So, uh, and, th and now you have nine out of 10 Americans, nine out of 10, who either use or prepare or go buy technology for help in preparing their tax code. So my dad, who's retired on a fixed income, has to take it to a, an accountant to get his taxes prepared. So this is your choice, Mike. Our, our vision is you can forego the deductions, don't have to, you can forego it, forego all keeping track of all those receipts and all everything else, forego all that and say, this is my rate, this is what I made, this is what I paid, this is what's owed on a postcard. Well, I think more or less. It'll be, it'll, it'll depend on your situation. Well, this is where the glass can be looked at half empty or Absolutely. half full. Absolutely, no question. Um, I agree that tax reform is complicated. I can give you the good news that Democrats and Republicans all support having some type of tax reform. It's how we get there. I am a big proponent of keeping the mortgage interest deduction. And part of that reason is I grew up where education and owning a home was the American dream. And so when I think about how we want to simplify it, I'm kind of on the other side. I think we need to do a better job of education and awareness and making people understand the difference between the single deduction and the double deductions. Because if you say to me, oh, it doesn't matter and it's simple and, and, and don't worry about it, and, and, and you don't know any better, you might do that. But on the other hand, if I say to you, this will allow you to have taxable deductions. Most people start with a starter home, and then they get a home that's a, a little larger, and they know that because it helps them with the equity in at home, and they know they're gonna have something to deduct, and they know it's gonna give them some stability. So when we look at charitable giving, and when we look at the mortgage interest deduction, I, I, I'm a proponent of those things. Does, I hate the word reform. Does the word reform mean tax it anyway, cut, <laughs> or does the reform mean tax hike? Uh, well, our goal, our goal is simplification as well as depends on, on who, right? So you have, seven, you have seven brackets today, seven. We want to collapse it into three. That's part of complexity. We have the highest corporate rate in the industrialized world at 35%. So there's consensus 
not in terms of where, but consensus on reducing the corporate rate. Even Barack Obama wanted to reduce well, the corporate rate. But very few companies pay that rate. Exactly. GE gets a yeah. refund, utilities pay 3%. So when you reduce the corporate rate, which is high, yeah. will you also shut off those well, loopholes? Well, that's, that's, you have to. I mean, you have to get rid of... you have the support of, to do you that? Have to, we don't know yet. That's our <laughs> yeah. goal. But that's, you know, that's why it hasn't been done since 1986. And that's why we've tweaked it and added pages rather than reduced pages. But we're losing, we're losing jobs and we're losing employers who do business all over the world because of the rate and complexity. And, and Pat mentioned 1986, and he's right. It's been about 30 years. But when you look at that corporate tax room, then they took it down to 28%. And, and most of the studies will say, if we go from the 35% to the 28% now, you don't then hurt the consumers. But when you look at some of the things we're hearing in Congress on the other side, they want to take it down to 20%. Now, I tell you what, that's going to come back to the consumers, and that's going to make a difference. What about the, the foreign? The Republicans want to oh, the bring the, bring the uh, revenues back to the United States that are tax-free, more or less, in foreign countries. Isn't that better to get a half a loaf of those taxes and get that money back here in the U.S. and get some tax money from it and get investment from it? Joyce Beatty? Are you talking about the bat tax? I don't know what you call it. No, it's no, the, no, what, what, what Mike's talking about is, and you're making my argument here, so if she makes a widget, or ranch. Ba Beatty Ranch, okay, Beatty right. Ranch Company, and she makes a widget in Columbus, Ohio, and she sells that widget in Germany or Japan, and she's competing with you, the Canadian, and, and me, the Italian, guess what? We're selling, that, we're selling that wherever you and I get taxed, as she does, right. where we sell it. The difference is we don't get taxed when we bring the profits back to our country. When she brings it back to the U.S., it's taxed. So what happens? People keep their, or companies keep their profits parked overseas. So That's that, the repatriation Isn't issue. that a bad thing, Joyce Beatty, and shouldn't we figure out a way to get think, that money back? I think we should figure out a way to get the money back. And that's so, part of tax reform. Exactly. And, and so that's why it's complicated. But the argument is that this is a giveaway to mm -hmm. corporations but, and, to, exactly. and to upper income. So where is the balance for you as a Democrat? I, I think the balance for me is we have to sit down. We have to hear. I mean, we have small businesses who come into my office every day, whether it's this tax, whether it's the bat tax, we have single, dozens of single line pages of people who are saying, you all have to fix this, but you can't do it on the backs of consumers. You can't do it on the backs of making a difference that if you are a stable, large, wealthy corporation against those small businesses. We know that small businesses are the economic engines of our country. Immigration. Uh, Donald Trump has taken a lot of heat for his immigration bans, now held up for the second time in the courts. Um, basically, his ban would preclude immigration from a certain select group of countries Seven. that have been, in isolated cases, folks from these countries have been responsible for terrorist attacks around the world, including one here in Columbus at Ohio State. A Somali refugee was responsible for the one at Ohio State in November. In this time of high tension, isn't it wise to just hit the pause button, assess our immigration policies with regards to these countries, and then move forward. I think that's a good response. And, and you mentioned the Ohio State University. And, and certainly, I consider myself still a, a part of, of that family after being there for four years. But let me give you the flip side of what his ban did. I can remember watching TV that Sunday morning when they were stopping families only because they were from one of the seven countries that you mentioned. And they were holding them up in the airport. We had a person who's wife was at The Ohio State University and had been separated simply because of the country that they were coming from. I was so enraged with that that I got up and my husband, Attorney Otto Beatty, and I went out to the airport to make a difference. We called the New York congressman and asked him to intervene so we could make sure that this person who's providing great services to our community, who's a product of The Ohio State, could be reunited with their family. Uh, we've got to get this right. There are too many people that pay taxes, they're educated here, and our democracy is about the great diversity that we have. And most of these folks are not ISIS terrorists, or, and, and by their own admission, they're not even inspired by ISIS. Pat T. Barry, do you support the ban as proposed by Donald Trump? And 
we're not going to round up you know, tens of millions of undocumented workers in this country. What is, what well, is your position on immigration reform? And I, yeah, so Joyce and I tend to agree here. Like Joyce, I had four years at Ohio State, but unlike Joyce, they paid her. I paid them <laughs> for the four years. Uh, but I'm still a Buckeye, and I love Ohio State, and I agree with what she said. Uh, but as full disclosure, as the son of immigrants, I, I have maybe a different take than the president does on this. But I think there should be a pause button because it's, it's, it's important to know who's coming in. And we live in a very challenging time internationally. But at the end, I mean, in, in, at the end of the day, and, and Joyce and I think are 100% in agreement on this, immigration is important to our country. It's important to our country for our future. It has been important in the past, and we've got to get it right. And we've got to get it bipartisan, because if it's not bipartisan, it won't stand the test of time. Foreign policy, um, Congressman Tiberi, in August of 2013, soon after Syria used chemical weapons, you signed a letter uh, that urged President Obama to lay out his plans for military action against Syria. The letter Absolutely. reads, there is no doubt the humanitarian crisis in Syria is getting worse. Yeah. The Syrian people, this was 2013 now, the Syrian people are clearly suffering, and it's important that Congress be given a voice in making a decision about what possible response may be. President Trump did not consult with Congress, did not get your approval before striking that airfield yep. after the latest chemical attack. Yep. Was he right to do so? Should he have gone to you first? No, I think, I think he was right to do so, and I think that now is time for him to lay out the plans. Uh, this, uh, you know, this red line that, that the president, previous president uh, drew with respect to chemical weapons uh, was, was violated, and it showed that America wasn't serious, quite frankly. So sure, should and he this, have sent missiles to Syria right then and there without consulting you? Well, no, yes, because the, in, in terms of crossing that red line, we all supported that. But in terms of a longer-term policy, yes, he should consult. Because the way I read this is, in 2013 it was, ask us, then shoot. No. And now no, it's, no. okay, no. you shot, no. and now come to us. If there is a chemical attack, mm -hmm. you cannot come and debate in Congress. This is about long-term policy with respect to Congress and the United States of America. Not, he's the commander-in-chief, and he's called the commander-in-chief for a reason. Congresswoman Beatty, this is chemical weapons. We saw the pictures, seven, at least 70 people, women, children, awful. It's, you know, it's, you can't, you, it's hard to compare war atrocities, but this was pretty bad. Was he right to send those missiles over there? I think it was horrific when you saw the, the photos and everything. But I have a, a little different take. You're president of the United States, and you know that. I think you have an obligation to not just shoot from the hip. I think you have an obligation, whether you're Democrat or Republican, to have some type of plan. This is not new. He knew when he campaigned where we were with Syria, where we were with Russia. So this didn't happen overnight. So I was appalled to find out that he was going to have the airstrike and then not have a plan. So what did we get? The, the airports opened up the next day. Uh, business as usual. We still have not had the dialogue. I think Pat and I both agree on the part that c Congress should be engaged and that there should be some type of strategic plan. You don't want somebody just pushing the button to push the button and there's no plan for it. The, Congress, the Constitution says only Congress has the right to declare war. Yeah. <clears throat> Will we ever get back to the point where, co where think, the president stands in the well of the Congress and asks for your approval to I, declare I war? I think, and I don't want to sound very idealistic, but I think we represent the people in this room. This room is made up of the great democracy that we represent. I have an obligation to listen to them and to go back and take that in consideration. And I think the president by the Constitution should have that same obligation to consult with us. There is a reason that you have scholars who serve on the Homeland Security Committee, that serves on intelligence, and that we have all of these great minds who should come together. Pat Seabury, do we ever get back to the, where Congress actually will declare war like we did in World War II? Oh. Well, you ever see that no, day again? History between uh, most of us who are in the room uh, of Congress shows that we haven't done that. Uh, it'd be great to do that, but most importantly, if it's something, if it's something like what happened with respect to Syria, that there's a chemical attack, and everybody in the world knows that this is horrific, and we are the leader of the free world, and what we didn't do in the last administration 
in what we are now doing in this administration is at least telling the world that there are rules that, that are if violated, like chemical weapons on innocent women and children, that there's going to be a response to that. But in terms of long term, our policy in Syria or, or anywhere else in the world, and by the way, there are troops in Syria, American troops, that were put there by the previous president. Let's just make, let's clear the record on that. We'll get to audience questions in a moment, so if you haven't written down your questions, please get them to the members of the program committee. Um, but let me uh, ask one last question, and I uh, respectfully require that your answer include the word yes or the word no. No. Yes. Okay. Um, Ohio's congressional districts are very gerrymandered, but all but a couple are really non-competitive. The lines this time around were drawn by Republicans. Democrats would have done the same, and they have in other states. Uh, highly partisan districts lead to hardened positions and where compromise gets you a primary opponent. Joyce Beatty, I'll start with you because you have the second safest congressional district in Ohio. Will you support, remember yes or no, will you support redistricting reform that will make your district more competitive? Yes and no. <laughs> that ain't good enough. Well, 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 let me answer it this way, and I'll, I'll be brief. Your question has to fit my answer. <laughs> and, and so my answer is yes, depending, no, if not. Uh, while some may say I have the safest district, you will also second safest. second safest district. You will also know that in Central Ohio, uh, which is very diverse, I have 90% of Columbus. We've never had uh, an African American. Uh, I think when you have diversity in the room, it speaks volumes. I am going to be bold enough to say that we have a relationship and we come to the middle because we have diversity. I understand the issues of, of working women and single moms and married and working and I'm a minority. So I think where we are at this point in our country that you can't just look at saying, I'm going to because your district, and keep in mind, I don't have a minority the district, argument, the argument but I don't have a minority district, and so mm -hmm. people out here need to know that. My district is less than 30%, and you can add up Hispanics, Asians, Somalians, African Americans, Italians. Italians. <laughs> so I Ladies. think it is a good representation, and, and that's unprecedented. But the argument is that they've pushed the minorities into one district, and you have less of a voice. But that's not true for my district. My district is less than 30% okay. minorities. So yes so or no, will you, will you support redistricting Non-minorities or white folks vote for me, and I represent them. Okay. So is it a yes or a no? no? I haven't, well, let me say this. You're not gonna find any good elected official or politician that's gonna say yes or no to something they haven't seen. So if you tell me they want to have a redistricting plan that's going to include a diverse commission of people looking at it, including some former elected officials and then other people from the community, I will take a very open look at it. See if we can get a yes or no from Pat Tiburn. Your district is not quite as safe as Congressman Babies. Wow. Can oh, I quote you on that? You have That's a, not According true. to the <laughs> political report, no, you're a 7 in 10 chance of winning by Democrats. You're a 6 in 10 chance of being won by Republicans, so okay. slightly less competitive. Will you support reform that makes your district more competitive? And take all my minority yes. folks. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, political guru Kurt Steiner, who was involved in my 2000 campaign, will tell you I had a 12-year run in a very competitive district. Charlie <laughs> Cook called it a D plus one. So I, I am... I'm fine, you know, whatever. I'm fine, yes. However, let me just uh -oh. say this, <laughs> just say this. Thank For you. those of you in the room, including maybe Mike, but he's just a reporter, not just a reporter, <laughs> a reporter, <laughs> to, to, say, to say that this is gonna solve problems. Let me give you an example. Arizona has a commission. Uh -huh. We have the leader of the Progressive Caucus, one go. of the most liberal members in, in the United States Congress, and two Freedom Caucus members in Arizona. So it doesn't always lead to outcomes that you might think it will lead to. 
Okay. And, and I agree with that. And, and I think because of the audience and the public watching, it's important for us to do a better education and awareness if we're going to really want diversity, if we want to have equal representation. And, and for so long, certainly as we know, and, and they put it in the Constitution, that we have to have minority representation. And, and for me, you mentioned it, oftentimes it's our primaries that we get targeted for. And I would hope as we look at redistricting that we just don't go so far into a formula because I agree with Pat, you might not get what you think you're going to get out of it. And that's why we still have elections and people should vote for people who represent them. Okay. Uh, it is CMC's tradition to take questions from the audience today. The questions were written in advance and selected by members of the Metropolitan Club's program committee for appropriateness and balance. And let's get our first question. Hi, I'm Carol McGuire, and I'm a member of the program committee. Um, thank you all for being here today, um, especially our panel. And I thank you all in the audience for submitting uh, a wealth of questions. We've done our best to try to find those which are representative of any number of those questions here. Um, due to limited time, we can only do uh, sometimes a bit abbreviated questions or consolidation of questions. So the first question I have is from Jody um, Shiny, I believe, and it's regarding energy. Why is it more focused being placed on s a renewable energy rather than dead technologies like coal? That one. Take that one. Well, through so through the tax uh, code, we we subsidize both, and there is a there's a thought that we should subsidize less of both. Uh, the reality is for states like Ohio, I'll just put my Ohio hat on, we have most of our transmission of electricity through coal, and it's cheaper. And so I look at my mom and dad who are on a fixed income, senior citizens, and I think through their lens of their eyes, because Joyce and I can afford any sort of transition to more expensive electricity, but what do you do with people who are on a fixed income today? Because they're electricity would necessarily go up. So I think you have to be thoughtful about the way you do this. And we have, you know, quite frankly, natural gas is a big boom to Ohio right now. And I think that should be what we really look at. How much help should we give the renewables, Congresswoman Beatty? Well, I, I agree with, with Pat. And, and I think this is what you have to look at depending on who you represent and where you are. And we're in Ohio. And, and for us, I think we have to figure out how to bridge both. Because if you look, if I go further north and you look in some of the rural communities, they only care about coal because n not only for how they use it, but for the jobs. And we have an administration that has promised them that these jobs are going to come back. I'm not sure how that's going to really happen. So I, I think we have to have a bridge of both. This question comes from John Lowe III. Is there any real support for removing dark money from campaigns? That would be great. Yes. No. Well, well, you know, having an ad run against me by a conservative group and having ads run against me by liberal groups, that would be great in, in concept, but the Supreme Court has spoken on that. No, I think if we have the ability to shine the light on all contributions and have more transparency, for the Mike Thompsons and Scott Lights of the world to, to see where we're getting our, our money and have, you know, one of the things that McCain-Feingold did, quite frankly, was weaken political parties. And when you weaken political parties, you actually helped these groups on the left and the right become more engaged in campaigns and more effective in campaigns, quite frankly. So more transparency for parties, more transparency for, for uh, elected officials, and I think that would help actually help stop money flow to these dark money groups. I absolutely believe in transparency. I, I look at it when you have the dark monies. It's like somebody wants to say something about you, and they don't sign their name to it. It's an anonymous. Well, you don't know if it's true or not. I think that if I'm taking dollars, I should have to report openly to the public where those dollars are coming from. Because I think when you don't, it lets you hide behind something that you're not proud of, yet you took those dollars. And so I think that's where you come in again. We should 
advocate together that you should have to have full transparencies on companies, individuals, where their dollars are coming Can from. I add one thing to that? And I know this is a little controversial, but we have contribution limits. Mm -hmm. They don't. What? So I'm accountable for the way I vote. She's accountable for the way she votes. We have to answer to that. A group that doesn't have contribution limits, doesn't have transparency, they can lie about her. They certainly lie about me. So if you actually raise contribution limits for those of us, have more transparency, immediate, immediate uh, disclosure for Alan Miller to see where my money's coming from, that I think is something that makes sense. Or to give them caps and limits that they well, can't that, just give. That's the bottom dollars. line problem or issue is that the Supreme, Supreme Court has said that money is free speech. Right. Would you support, it would probably take a, a change in the Constitution to say right. money is not free speech. Oh boy, I mean that's a, that's a tough one. I think the easier and, and more practical way to go, because you're going to have a protracted legal battle, Mike, if you actually want to change the way that campaigns are run, lift those contribution levels for us and for parties, make it more transparent. A party's more accountable to some group that's coming out of California or New York so or Washington, D.C. More money is the solution? Well, so, more, well McCain-Feingold, so, so yeah. note your point, McCain-Feingold was sold as less money, mm -hmm. more accountability, yeah, more transparency. What has happened? More money, less transparency, and actually less accountability because more money is flowing outside of people who are more accountable. I think you need more accountability and less money. Uh, That'd I, be great. I, but I think it's going to be difficult to change the Constitution. So I would support it, but I think you're right, it's a long legal battle. But I think we have to be in a position that we should, as Democrats and Republicans, it doesn't make sense to me if you can take an Ohio race for a U.S. Senate seat and have a Democrat candidate spending $40 million and a Republican candidate spending $40, $41 million and children go to bed hungry every day and without an education. We are better than that. Yeah, yeah. but let me, just, let me just say this. And Joyce and I love each other, but that, so now we're like talking at a think tank. I mean, that, that is a great theory and I agree with that theory, but if you're a kid who just first in your family to graduate from high school, and you want to run for Congress, and, and you want to advertise your message on, sorry, you guys are right in front of me, Channel 10, the, leading, the, the, the leader in ratings in, in Columbus. There you go, I complimented you. <laughs> it costs a lot of money. And so, yeah, great. You know, I got great name ID, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm okay, but if I don't, my name is funny, and Scott, mispronounces it all the time. So I gotta get a I gotta get a, a message on TV and, and it cost a boatload of money, right John? A boatload of money. So if you have if you don't if you if you but do you it that way even the playing field for do. both sides. Right, let's right. Get, we got just time's running short, see so we can get a couple That's more questions. That's the reality though. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. So I'm Kermit Whitfield and I'm asking a question on behalf of a number of people uh, asked concerning this. So what are your positions on the border adjustment tax? I'm against it. So I'll give you a yes or no on that. Um, and, and, Border and, adjustment tax is 20% tax on imports coming into the United yeah, States. States. It's going to part of the way to pay for the wall, apparently, right? Well, well no. 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 <laughs> That's another whole Good issue. Good one, Mike. Right, that's another. That was good. So, so how many people have an iPhone? How, how, how many people uh, put gasoline in their car? How many people have a car that was imported? Uh, think I about it. All of that. those things. Siri keeps interrupting. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> High technology is incredible. So, so when you think about that, those costs will be put back to the consumer. So there is no way. I mean, I have a lot of, I'm a business person. I'm a former retailer. So when you think about what you were paying. I, I had a group in to see me the other day. So, and, and their corporate leadership came in and they said, for example, let's just say it's big lots. So you go there because you're intrigued with the cost and the uniqueness of the things that you can buy. Have so you been to big lots? I have. Good. I am a big, big lots fan. Well, I got that. And, and so when you think about going there, and I can afford those things. There are other people who go there because it is their life saving for them to be able to get something because they can't go somewhere else financially. Well, if they get caught up in the back tax, they're gonna have to up those prices on some of those unique items that are only germane to them 
And who's going to suffer? Pat T. Ray, Pat T. Ray. Yeah, how think, do you get think, people to build stuff here to avoid that? Well, that, that is the reason for it. That's the reason the speaker has come out uh, for it and kind of his plan. Joyce has really uh, ha has a good handle on it. Uh, I, I think those are the concerns. And we've had many of those folks, including Big Lots, who's, by the way, moving their corporate headquarters into my district from Joyce's district. No, nope, that's you. not actually true. Oh, God, you can't. <laughs> that's not actually true. They're leaving part of it in in my district, and the new building Sorry, guys. is actually in my district. So anyhow, um, we are working through that because that is the exact issue, Mike. How do you encourage more jobs, more corporate headquarters, more employers to not only keep their, their jobs here, but bring jobs back here? Joy said, no, do you support a, a tax? Yeah, it, depends. Tax. It, depends. It, it, it depends. It depends how this evolves. <laughs> Okay. and what, uh, what we can do to ensure what she says doesn't happen. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Again, this represents a number of questions um, asked by the audience. Is there any significant support for reducing the federal debt? Oh, man. <laughs> two yeah. minutes. I mean, yeah, two e minutes e left. Everybody, <laughs> I wish I had my chart with, with me because here's the challenge. In 1965, Mandatory spending was a third of the budget. Now it is 69% of the budget. In 2015, it was 68% of the budget. Oh, there's and, a chart. And, oh, oh do we, here, where's the camera? Where's the camera? <laughs> um, and so you can see here the, the gold. Now that's right? a good press secretary. The gold, it's like Pac-Man. It's the gold. Here's where it was in 1965. So the 31% are all the agencies. The 69% Medicare, Social Security. Medicaid are the three biggest. Interest on the debt is going to get bigger as interest rates go up. This is a big problem, ladies and gentlemen. 10,000 baby boomers are signing up for Medicare today, yesterday, tomorrow, every day next week. This number is going to continue to get bigger. Well, this 31% is national defense. It's legal aid. It's the passport agency. It's customs. It's all the different agencies that we continue to fight these big budget battles over a shrinking piece of the pie. This is what's causing the debt. So Joyce Beatty is changes, cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security inevitable if you want to control the debt that this country faces. I think there's probably a third option. I think we have to sit together and, and we have to figure this out because there are a lot of expenditures for things that aren't those things like legal services. And, and you, 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 I'm not going to be in favor of Medicaid and Medicare and those things because they're on what I'm going to call the protected side anyway. Those are our mandatory services. And we should, and, and, and you know what? We need to protect that because you try to tell your parents or my mother yeah. who paid into systems, whether it was Social Security, and now just because they're old, we're going to say, oops, we made a mistake, and we're going to take that away. We're, we're not. We're, that's no not going to happen. I think on the other side, there are some things that we need to do with closing the loopholes. And this is where real tax reform comes in. For those who are in that 1%, we need to close some of those loopholes. We need to get more creative. And then we would be able to shift some of those dollars. Because while you said earlier, and I agree with you, if you take something like legal services, and, and, and when you think about the number of veterans, which we both support and have legislation, I have a bill where we want to make sure that they can get pro bono services. Well, if you take away legal aid and those folks who take care of those individuals, where are we? OK. We do have time for one more question. This, Mindy. this question comes from Jennifer Neimer. What, would, what do you plan to do to ensure public schools are fully funded and public school educators are empowered to help children learn and grow? Wow. I'm going to fight as hard as I can to work for public education. I'm a product of public education. My mother and every one of my siblings uh, worked in public education as teachers. And, and I think it's so important because education is the economic engine to our future. Whether it is pre-K, uh, we know how well Head Start, government program that propelled a, a lot of children. We have The Ohio State University, a state-supported school 
that also held their tuition down when I was there because they got it, they understood it. We have a U.S. secretary that we need to do a better job of educating because here's, here's the problem. She doesn't understand education, let alone public education. So uh, here's the reality. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the education I got. First of my family to graduate from high school, a proud graduate of the Columbus Public Schools, critically important. But the reality is, is that education is mostly funded through state and local taxes, not the federal government. And I've talked to school board member after school board member after superintendent after superintendent. The federal government provides more mandates and less money. And they'd rather have less mandates if they're going to have less money. And going back to this chart, anytime soon, the reality is we're not going to spend more money because it comes out of this 31%, not the 69 And so it is mostly a local and state issue. My girls, my four girls who are getting a good public education, 90% of it, 90 is local property taxes. But, but let me just say on the federal level, uh, we employ federal employees, many of them make, if you take our chief of staff, some of our legal counsel, six-figure salaries. And yet, what's one of the greatest benefits with federal dollars that we do? If they stay with us, what's your longest employee? Somebody that might have been with you for eight or 12 of the 12 years you're there, they get almost, they get 10, they can get $10,000 a year to pay back their college loans that's federal money. So if, if I'm going to, in my office, which I proudly do, sponsor paying, using government monies to pay back their education loans from college, we're in the business. And just because maybe schools are getting state and local dollars, it doesn't mean that we need to turn our back onto the Pell Grants, to the oh, Head no. Starts, and to some of those programs. So I'm a proponent of putting more federal dollars into education, and teachers need to be paid more. If I could do a federal grant tomorrow to subsidize teachers, I would. I'd like to thank Congressman T. Berry, Congressman Bay. She's, she's before the thing started, she says, I hope my answers match your questions. So, <laughs> for the most part, I think they did. So I appreciate your time and your candor, and hopefully we learned something here today. Carol. Thank you. And I thank hope you. you all enjoyed today's forum. You can always view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV, Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website on YouTube. Please help me thank our sponsors, Hanna News Service, Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, Dispatch Media Group, Steiner Public Relations, WBNS 10 TV, and our speakers, Joyce Beatty, Pat Tiberi, and Mike Thompson. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you at CMC in all our future forums. Thanks for coming today.